right. Hi, and welcome to the third day of the 12th International Forum on IEU Fishing. I'm Anna Oberg, and I work in the Energy, Environment and Resources Program of Chatham House. And uh, thanks for joining today's discussion, which will focus on subsidies. It's really great to see that so many are logging onto the webinar. We're up in 200 mm -hmm. already. Before we kick off today's discussion, uh, I'd just like to highlight a few takeaways from yesterday's session, which focused on gender and IEU fishing and the role that women play in fisheries. And some of these takeaways were that uh, women play a key role in fisheries, but their role is often overlooked and uh, they are excluded from decision making processes. And as you know, IU fishing is often associated with uh, human trafficking and other forms of human rights abuses. And while the majority of the victims that are forced to work at sea uh, are men and boys, women are often coerced into working in onshore operations and in the processing chain. And as men get trafficked into working at sea, they also be behind their families uh, and this can increase their vulnerability. And these women, girls uh, and boys, uh, they are sometimes referred to as the hidden victims of IU fishing. And the speakers highlighted that there is a real need to address the lack of data disaggregated by sex so that proper gender analysis can be conducted and that this is really crucial for combating IAU fishing and promoting gender equality at the same time. And they also underscored that it's important actions taken to address IAU fishing uh, are targeted and that the integrated gender perspective so that the response does not have a detrimental impact on women and girls. And finally, it was made very clear by the speakers that women need to play a part and that they can really play a part in finding and implementing solutions uh, to combating eye fishing. So promoting gender equality and strengthening the role of women in fisheries is therefore really, really important. And in this context, uh, the important role of uh, women's um, fisheries networks were highlighted and that strengthening these uh, can make an important contribution to the fight against IU fishing. So coming back to today's discussion, uh, we have an excellent set of uh, speakers, which I will let our chair introduce later. Uh, but before we kick off, I'd just like to quickly run through the, the logistics of the webinar. So as you know, um, you can submit questions via the Q&A function uh, found at the bottom of the Zoom kind of panel. Um, and we will do, do our very best to answer as many as possible. Uh, we do expect that there will be a lot of questions, so please do bear with us in case we're not able to answer uh, exactly all of them. Um, if you do want to ask a question verbally, uh, you can raise your hand um, and we'll try, try to take a few of those as well. Um, of course, this, um, this webinar um, is taking place on Zoom, but we also, uh, we're also live streaming it on the Chatham House website, just so you know. Great, so now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Professor Rashid Sumaila, who is Director of the Fisheries Economics Research Unit at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia, and who will be chairing this session. Uh, thanks all again for joining, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Over to you, Rashid. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Anna, for the introduction and for putting this amazing uh, conference seminar together, bringing people all over the world. Uh, at the last count, I was told that we're expecting over 400 people to be online, which is amazing. There's a topic of uh, huge interest, uh, subsidies and uh, IUU they, where they overlap and intersect. And so, so it's, it's going to be fun. As you know, subsidies are a, a big issue globally and nationally and locally because of the of the impact uh, that theory, economic theory and the science of fishing have shown to us that uh, a lot of the subsidies our governments give to the fishing sector actually uh, harm, can do harm the, the environment and the fish stocks and therefore also can harm fisheries. So, so these are huge. We're talking about $35 billion a year estimate of a, of a, of a sector which is about a, hundred billion dollars. So that's a huge chunk of, of the gross revenues that subsidies and out of the 35, 22 billion have been earmarked or identified as uh, potential to actually push fishers to fish more than they would otherwise. 
price. So that's huge. IUU is also huge estimates of up to 23 million tons of fish uh, taken out of the waters illegally or are uh, and or not being reported or in areas where there's no management. So this is also a big problem. And so the panel we put together here, uh, an amazing group of uh, speakers, three of them, and uh, they're going to take us into the different dimensions of this uh, subsidies issue and as it relates to, to IEU. So on the panel, we have Robert Atta, he's a, a principal uh, at MRAG, which is a, a UK consultancy that has been working in this area for years, actually, lots of experience. So uh, Mr. Atta will, will kind of take us and give us broad picture of the, the relationship between subsidies and, and IUU, and actually also zoom on a part of the world just to make things concrete and, and clear to, to you. Then we move on to the more political side of this uh, issue of subsidies. And we're so lucky to have Ambassador Santiago Wills, who is the permanent representative and ambassador of the mission of Colombia, who actually has been tasked with the important job of helping the world, getting all the negotiators and ambassadors to help us deliver the mandate given to the WTO to, to help us uh, discipline and or redirect or whatever of the subsidies that are harmful to the environment and therefore to fishes and to all of us. So that is that. Then finally, last but not the least, Alice Tippin is, uh, is at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And Alice has been in this business for, for years, almost as long as I have been in it. And so she's been following the negotiations. So she will give us a bit more detail on, uh, on how the negotiations are going, especially as it relates to, and when I mean negotiations on how to remove or discipline subsidies and how that relates to, to IUU fishing. So it's going to be amazing. Each of them will get about maximum 10, 10 minutes. And I know some of them will even save us some of these minutes. So we have more time for the Q and A to follow where we will hear from you, uh, your questions, please, as um, Anna just said, uh, you, you you send them through the chat and we'll find a way to get as many of them uh, discussed as possible, but they will also be uh, somewhere on the web. So so we, we keep the dialogue going. All right, I wouldn't want to waste any more of your time. So we just kick off and uh, Robert, please uh, take the stage and tell us something. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rashid. Um, I'll just try and share screen and hopefully um, okay, can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk through uh, a little bit of a, 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 a study, that, a recent analysis that we, that myself and some colleagues at MRAG have undertaken um, uh, around looking at harmful fisheries subsidies and the sort of risk that they pose. So the UN Sustainable Development Goals include targets on removing harmful subsidies that highlight a number of issues and lead really to sort of three interrelated questions that we considered in our study. The first of these is what are the risks that harmful subsidies pose to marine resources, particularly fish stocks? How can we identify those subsidies that need addressing as a priority? And thirdly, how can we measure and monitor progress towards their removal or could we potentially so the first thing is, well, what do we mean by a harmful subsidy? For the purpose of, of this study, um, we looked at harmful study, uh, subsidies in terms of um, those that are, have the potential to increase fishing capacity. And we considered in particular the potential effect of the subsidy on fishing effort in the absence of management or regulation. So we assumed that there was no, we, we were looking at unregulated open access fisheries and then what, what might these subsidies actually do so if there's a potential increase in fishing capacity or fishing effort, then we would consider that that would be a harmful subsidy. And the focus on the study is really on the environmental impacts, in particular on the fish stocks. So what, what, do, what could these um, subsidies do to fish stocks around the world? And if we think about um, subsidies in relation to, to IEU, um, we need to think about how these are linked to the budget. 
relevant to the, the purpose of this uh, meeting. So firstly, um, there are subsidies that uh, are applied to a whole fleet. So the managers don't really know if the vessels are or are not acting illegally. So an example would be uh, fuel or insurance subsidies that, that cover both illegal and legal operators. Secondly, there's um, subsidies that relate to unreported catches. So catches that we may have find that catches are being underreported by vessels that are operating in the fisheries that are being subsidized. And then finally, we may find that there are subsidized vessels that are, that are uh, fishing in, on stocks that are not covered by effective management. So they're fishing on uh, unregulated stocks. Well, and both subsidies- Jump in. Can you talk closely to the mic? Because sometimes yeah. you disappear a little bit. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So both subsidies and IUU fishing can both contribute to, to overcapacity and create a risk of overfishing. So both uh, really need to be addressed. So we looked at subsidies across six major fishing nations or, or blocks, which are these ones listed here. And for consistency, our data collection focused on, on one year, which was 2016. And in our analysis, we identified that around $20 billion uh, worth of, of subsidies could be considered to be uh, harmful subsidies that are at risk of increasing fishing capacity and fishing effort. Uh, and this is consistent with the figure that Rashid just gave you. Um, we then looked at linking the harmful subsidies to the fleets operating by FAO area, and then down to the fish, to the stocks that were being fished by these fleets. And then we looked at the status of those stocks. Um, so we were following through to look at the effect of the subsidy on the, on the stock or the risk uh, that, that it posed. And where status of the stock was unknown, we took a precautionary approach so that we assumed that the, that the stock was being overfished and experiencing overfishing. And here's an example uh, for West Africa. This is a Kobe plot. So it shows the sort of relationship between um, biomass and its relation with MSY and uh, fishing effort, uh, fishing mortality, and that's and the relation with the fishing mortality and F MSY. So uh, the green zone is where you want to be and the red zone is where you, what you want to avoid. And so this is for West Africa for, this, for the stocks that we could get stock assessment information for. And the circle sizes just indicate the, the size of the catch by the subsidized fleets. So this plot shows that in this region of the world, the, tar the species targeted by subsidized fleets uh, include both demersal uh, fish, such as the cassava croaker, uh, tuna and tuna-like species, uh, and also small pelagic fish like the sardinellas and anchovies. Um, several of these stocks are also important to, uh, important to local coastal small-scale fishers, such as the round sardinella and the cassava. And you can see quite clearly here that, that the predominance is towards the, the red area. So uh, risk that, that the uh, subsidy, subsidized fleets are fishing on uh, overfished stocks. Um, the focus today has been really on, on subsidies to the catching sector. And we also note that, that subsidies to aquaculture and processing could also potentially stimulate investments in catching capacity. So these can be considered to be more indirect subsidies. So for example, uh, securing supplies of fish, either for fish feed for, for aquaculture or through vertical integration contract fishing to secure uh, fish for processing could also uh, lead to risks of increased risks of overfishing and illegal fishing. And this is an area that hasn't really received quite as much attention to date and I think is probably worthy of further exploration. So, in summary, the analysis has highlighted the, the risks associated with capacity enhancing subsidies, but also um, highlights that, that addressing this in a practical sense could require better data. Now, data and assessment availability and consistency may create challenges with respect to identifying and addressing uh, harmful subsidies through WTO processes, and Alice might be saying a bit more about that. Um, secondly, the approach could provide a means to independently assess progress towards uh, prohibition of harmful subsidies. And it could also provide a means to identify and prioritize subsidies based on the risks uh, of the fishing on the uh, stock sustainability. Um, thank you very much. Um, some of this is uh, of this analysis has gone into in more depth in the uh, IIED publication and that's available on the IIED website. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Robert, and uh, for, for giving us this kind of technical details. And, uh, and as you said, the report is available and can be, uh, all the members can, can get hold of it to get more details. Thanks a lot. Uh, so we move on and there will be time for Q&A, like we said at the end. So let's move on to our next speaker, Ambassador Wills. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sumaila, and uh, good afternoon to everyone and good morning if, if you're in another time zone. Good night as well. <laughs> well, first I would like to thank Chatham House for the opportunity to participate in this webinar so I can share with you some of my reflections on the ongoing WTO fisheries subsidies negotiations. As you know, and I was said at the beginning of, of uh, today's session, I am the chair of the negotiating group on rules in the WTO where the negotiations on fisheries subsidies are taking place. So of course I am speaking in my capacity as chair and I am not speaking on behalf of any WTO member, including my own country. So anything I say will be my own personal ideas and opinions. So just a required disclaimer as usual. But based on the questions that were posed for this session, I have prepared some, some remarks touching upon the mandate that we have for our negotiations in the WTO, and also to provide some insights on the process of these negotiations and on some strategies in building support for the fisheries subsidies reform. So as, as you know, the negotiations in the WTO on fisheries subsidies have been going on for a long time, almost nearly 20 years. Uh, as I have said before in different fora, uh, if this was a child in most countries, he would now be old enough to vote, to drink, and to drive. So I think it is fair to say that at, at this point, it is time for WTO members to finally let this poor child get a life of its own as a WTO agreement. And you also know that we have a very clear mandate from SDG target 14.6 and the 11th WTO ministerial conference. And that is to eliminate subsidies for illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, that's IEU, and prohibit certain forms of subsidies that contribute to overfishing and overcapacity. And of course, with special and differential treatment that is integral to the negotiations. So while the current situation of the COVID-19 pandemic explains the current delay, it does not explain why there was not an agreement years ago. So I'm going to go back in the past a bit and try to explain this. And partly the long time it has taken is because the negotiations are not as simple as they appear. There are already many international agreements and laws on fishing and fisheries management all over the world. There is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UN Fish Talks Agreement, the FAO Port State Measures Agreement, and other international agreements, plans of action, and codes of conduct. Many of these also took years to develop, and despite the effort that went into developing them, the problems of illegal fishing and overfishing have not gone away. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, they have gone worse. One reason there are worse could be because one important part of that big puzzle is still missing, and that is a prohibition on harmful subsidies. That's what we're trying to do at the WTO. And as this is a very important part of the puzzle, we have to make sure it fits rightly with the other parts. And doing so is not as simple, even if nobody's actually debating the need for it to fit. So fitting our part of the puzzle in the current state of international agreements and regulations dealing with fisheries is not an easy task. Another problem that we have had in the past is the lack of reliable data. So for example, illegal fishing is known to be significant, but of course, illegal fishers do not report their catch and nobody would admit to subsidizing them. Of course, I don't think any country deliberately subsidizes IUU fishing, but with no reports, we don't know exactly how big the problem is. I think we can agree that even the smallest estimates indicate that IUU fishing is a big problem. So similarly for subsidies, the WTO has a definition of a subsidy in the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, but not every member notifies its subsidies. And most of those that do notify do not provide data on the value of their subsidies. Meanwhile, other organizations use different definitions of subsidy, like the OECD for its fisheries subsidies estimate. But this does not cover all WTO members and the data is not always consistent from one OECD member to another or for the other countries that provide data. Other people even provide other estimates like the See Around Us project, but they also use different methodologies and it is hard to compare results or reconcile differences. Another point to bear in mind is that the WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies will be legally binding agreement. So precise terms and definitions are very important and they have to apply across all 164 members of the organization. That's not an easy task to do. In some cases, 
for these definitions, we can use other agreements, such, such as the definition of IAU fishing, for instance. But in some cases, there are no international agreed solutions or definitions, such as subsistence or additional fishing. So at this stage, most delegations agree it would be difficult for the WTO to establish a lot of new definitions. So we need to find creative ways to get around using these terms. Also on a very practical matter as well, is that the WTO has lots of agreements, but they all deal with trade and trade related issues. This is the first time that on the WTO negotiations are about sustainability. And that means that we have had to change our mindset a bit. A lot of negotiators have experience with subsidies and their impact on trade, but what impact does a subsidy have on sustainability is a new issue for us. Fortunately, after many years of negotiations, we appear to be getting familiar with it. On the other hand, I must say that we more or less have a structure for an agreement at this point, and even a good idea what the end result might look like in some areas, particularly a prohibition for subsidies going to IU fishing and subsidies for fishing stocks that are already overfished. I'm not going to go in depth in, 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 in the text, but there's something that maybe Alice will, will go a little bit more into substance. Uh, on the overcapacity and overfishing pillar, we're not completely there yet, as different members have different ideas about how to deal with this pillar. So more work is definitely needed in this pillar and it will have to be intense to get an agreement. In any case, I could add that when, when I looked at the history of the negotiations and the various proposals in this overcapacity and overfishing pillar, what struck me as a chair was not the differences, but the similarities among the different approaches. Of course, there were different levels of ambition, but the interesting thing is that each proposal aimed to achieve the same goal, which was an end to harmful subsidies. However, of course, a couple of weeks before the COVID-19 struck, we were having uh, important breakthroughs in this pillar as well. So, so those are good news for now. And, and I, I would just like to, to clarify a bit my job as the chair in the negotiations. And, and my job is not to, to, to judge members' proposals. My job is to guide members into delivering an agreement that they all can accept and that respects the mandate that we have. That does not mean, of course, that I just sit and listen. But instead, I'm trying to find the common elements among the different proposals on the table and try to nudge delegates towards an agreement. So as you can see, while the negotiations are complex and very time consuming, uh, I, I must say that I'm also fortunate in one way. That is that I have, I have been working with the six facilitators on the negotiations, each one dealing with a different area of the topics covered by, by this future instrument. One for IEU fishing, one for overfish stocks, one for overfishing and overcapacity, and three facilitators working on different issues that apply across these three substantive pillars. In July last year, they prepared draft texts, which have been used for negotiations along with new proposals from members. Since last July, the facilitators have been working on improving these texts, and the latest revisions were distributed on 10th April this year. These facilitators' drafts text will, will, will form the basis of a draft consolidated text that I am preparing, covering the three main pillars that I mentioned, that is IUU fishing, overfish stocks, and overfishing and overcapacity. Of course, in close consultations with members, I am currently thinking about how and when to circulate the draft text. This is, of course, a task that has been made even more complicated by this COVID-19 situation. So indeed, and it must be acknowledged, Right now, many countries are facing a problem much bigger than WTO disciplines and subsidies for fishing. Public health comes first, and the fact is that many delegations have problems coordinating with capitals and with each other. And this, this provides a lot of difficulty in the negotiating process. So, however, despite these difficulties created by the pandemic, we did manage to proceed in a written process for a discussion of a couple of proposals that were tabled by members right before the COVID-19 pandemic struck. And I think this was an important step taken during these difficult times. So there's still engagement in our negotiations. The good thing is that at the same time, I have not heard any delegations say that they're not committed to finishing these negotiations by the end of this year, even though we'll know that the 12th ministerial conference of the WTO will not be taking place in early June 2020 as originally intended. I, at this point, I cannot overemphasize that, that these negotiations are at a very delicate point. Since November last year, momentum has been building with a clear end date of early June at MC12. All delegations were focused on getting a result and all were ready to compromise. Indeed, many of the proposals we have seen since early 2019 have been aimed at compromise. Now, like some deus ex machina, 
something totally unexpected, totally unforeseen, and totally unrelated to the negotiations has interfered, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. So as chair, I have to respect the fact that some delegations have problems engaging. While there are many technological ways to hold meetings, we have to recognize that coordination with the authorities back home is difficult for many delegates, and coordination within some groups of members is harder than ever. So at this point, pushing too hard and too soon is pointless and could actually have a prejudicial effect. So talking about maybe strategies to build support for fishery subsidy reform, I think I would, I would like to underline that the first step of that reform is to successfully conclude the negotiations at the WTO. So at this moment, we need all the support we can get to make that first step. At this point, I should also say that, that uh, we've, we've been receiving mixed messages from civil society. Uh, a group of NGOs are calling for an immediate halt of the negotiations, but another group emphasizes on, on the deadline on 2020 and is pushing for, for, for the conclusion and uh, successful conclusion of these negotiations. So I think that it is now more than ever at these difficult times that, that all members in the WTO need strong and undivided support to complete the negotiations. This should be our focus. And as chair, I, I think we should all be careful that our next steps do not prejudice our goal of finishing these negotiations. And this is why uh, a, a very delicate balance has to be struck in how to move forward the process and how to, to do so in a process that is transparent, is an inclusive manner, and that we have all the ideas, all the visions from members on the table. So as I have been saying to members, at this moment, reaching an agreement on the fisheries subsidy negotiations is a common goal among the whole WTO membership. Reaching this goal will not only demonstrate the ability of the WTO as a multilateral organization to deliver new agreements, but also it will serve an important purpose on a bigger picture, that is providing a strong, a comprehensive and meaningful support to the health of our oceans and to the conservation and sustainable use of our marine resources. So I, I see my time is up, so I'll leave it at that, uh, Dr. Sumaila. Thank you very much. Dr. Sumaila, Chair, I, I think you are, you're in mute yet. Okay, I think, I, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, very good. So thank you very much, Ambassador, for giving us uh, uh, quite a, an excellent view of the political situation now. And so we, we can move on now to Alice, who will then take us into some of the details of the negotiation, especially at, as it relates to IU education. Uh, all right, uh, Alice. Th please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, indeed, Rashid, um, and a special thanks to, to Chatham House for, uh, for, for proceeding with this extremely important forum given the circumstances. Um, firstly, I hope everyone in the audience is also safe uh, and well, uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to, to participate. Um, I thought what might be useful following the first two presentations uh, is if I talked a little bit about what kinds of subsidies are being discussed uh, at the WTO and what kinds of rules um, are being negotiated, specifically with a focus on the rules that are being talked about to discipline subsidies to IUU fishing. So I'll just share my screen briefly. Here it is. Can everyone see that? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, so I work at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, um, and we're part of the civil society community that's extremely supportive of these negotiations. Uh, we take a, an impartial uh, approach to looking at the proposals on the table, um, but we're sort of part of the group that's very much in favour of a meaningful outcome um, for many of the, re the reasons I think that, that Robert talked about at the beginning, that this is one of the ways uh, in which we can have economic rules that really help to support the sustainability of global fisheries. Um, so I'm going to talk about the kinds of rules that are being discussed at the WTO. I'm going to look at what the main approach is. Here it is on the slide. And I'm going to talk about what some of the key decisions are that the negotiators are facing. Um, and if there are any negotiators in the audience, these will be very familiar to you. So in this part of the WTO negotiations, the discussion is really focusing on this on an approach that would require subsidies provided to fishing vessels or operators to be prohibited when a final determination of IUU fishing is made. 
So what does that mean? Broadly, it means that a member's subsidy obligation under this agreement is triggered by a final administrative decision taken by that same member or taken by another government after review and appeal, a decision that a vessel's engaged in activity that counts as illegal, unreported or unregulated under whatever the relevant laws are. Now that trigger of a subsidy obligation is not necessarily going to be totally automatic and we'll talk a little bit about what the requirements might be that attach to it later. And an important point to note here, and this was a, a kind of a difficult political uh, issue in the negotiations for a while, but an important point is that members agree that their ability to issue a determination of obligation of, of IU fishing is a right, it's not an obligation. And this was something that a number in particular of developing country members were, white, were quite concerned about, that somehow the idea of linking a subsidy obligation to determinations of IUU fishing created an additional obligation on them to make determinations of IUU fishing, when in fact what this agreement does is simply require countries to make a link. If there is a determination of IUU fishing, then the, the subsidizing member uh, needs to look at whether it needs to withdraw subsidies from the vessel or operator that's the subject of that determination. So some of the texts on the table also talk about an additional approach um, that could work in addition to this determination-based idea. And the idea there is that the w, that WTO members could also agree on a broader obligation that governments should have in place measures to ensure subsidies don't go to IUU fishing. So we could end up with a, a very specific kind of determination-based trigger and or something more general. So what are the, some of the key decisions? And those of you familiar with IUU fishing are probably already thinking about these. Um, you know, the first is sort of the obvious one, whose determination would trigger a subsidy obligation? And members have proposed a number of different options. They're up here on the slide based on different capacities or jurisdictions that exist under maritime law, different capacities that states have for responsibility for fishing activity. And there's probably most convergence around the first two of those options, the idea of a determination of IUU fishing made by a coastal state, WTO member, or by an RFMO. And the idea that a determination made by either of those entities could trigger a sub an obligation to remove subsidies. Um, again, to run through them perhaps just very briefly, coastal states obviously have the right to regulate fishing activities within their EEZs, so they're well placed to issue IU determinations in that particular geographical area. RFMOs, many of you of course are extremely familiar with them, um, also many of them maintain lists of vessels found to be engaged in IUU fishing. Um, and there's a, an interesting kind of question here about what due process requirements a WTO agreement might apply to an RFMO listing of a vessel in order for it to trigger a subsidy obligation. Flag states, again, have responsibility uh, for the activities uh, of vessels under their flag and particular responsibility for some of the social and technical uh, obligations for applying to vessels. Um, a couple of other ideas. The fourth is that a subsidizing government itself, if it made an IUU determination, that it could trigger essentially its own obligation to remove subsidies. And that might sound a little bit circular, but the idea here is that WTO members, if their fisheries department finds that a vessel or operator has been engaged in IUU fishing, that that should then require a very careful assessment of where the subsidies should continue to go from that same government to that vessel. And there are some governments already in, who have procedures in place to do this, but not all. A final idea is that uh, determinations of IUU fishing made by port states might also trigger the subsidy prohibition. So the first key decision, whose determinations trigger this obligation. The second key decision uh, in design, designing these rules is what due process steps uh, should be required before a determination triggers a subsidy obligation. And the, the basic policy challenge here that WTO members are grappling with is that members want some kind of safeguard that ensures that a determination made unfairly by one member doesn't automatically trigger another member's obligation to remove subsidies from a vessel or operator. But at the same time, those due process conditions can't be so strict that members can always escape the obligation to remove subsidies. And it's perhaps worth highlighting here just briefly that the objective here is that these due process requirements apply to the process of how a determination is made, 
but not to the validity or the enforceability of a decision. So a member is still free to decide, for example, what activity to focus on in its maritime control and surveillance efforts, or what activity justifies sanctions. But the administrative process of arriving at that determination would need to meet certain due process requirements if it's to trigger an obligation to remove subsidies under this WTO agreement. So turning now, and I'm conscious I'm going through this extremely quickly, but I'm happy to come back to the details in the discussion. The third and fourth decisions are also important. Um, so key decision number three is whether a WTO agreement should clarify, essentially limit, um, how, an how this obligation to remove subsidies should be implemented. And of the two options here, the idea uh, of proportionality in terms of the severity of the violation is obviously the more important. Um, so some members have proposed limiting the application of this rule by allowing the subsidizing member, so the member whose subsidy obligations uh, are impacted by these obligations, allowing the subsidizing member to decide that a determination related to a minor violation of a fishing rule did not justify the removal of subsidies. Now, the subsidizing member wouldn't have complete flexibility here under the proposals. They would still be required to remove subsidies if the, determine relate, if the determination related to a list of very serious offenses, but the obligation would be considerably limited. So that's one proposal. Um, the idea of duration also suggests that uh, there would be a minimum, ideally, amount of time during which the subsidy should be prohibited once a determination has been found. And the, the fourth key decision facing members is what, if any, special and differential treatment might be provided for developing country members under this rule on subsidies to IUU fishing. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of, it's, it's, it's a politically important decision and it's also a substantively important decision. Um, the ambassador mentioned the fact that the original mandate for these negotiations underlines the importance of special and differential treatment, um, ensuring that that's appropriate and effective. Um, but I think it's safe to say that the proponents of a rule on subsidies to IUU fishing proposed it essentially with a, a sort of on the, the assumption or the understanding that these this sort of fishing and these sorts of breaches were the kinds of breaches that every WTO member should be under the same obligation to withdraw subsidies from. So it's still not completely decided whether there will be special and differential treatment for developing country members here. Those that, those that suggest there should be have proposed a number of different ideas. Generally, these focus on flexibility and how the discipline applies with respect to subsidies for unreported and unregulated fishing. So splitting up the I, the U and the U, um, because broadly, I think members seem to agree the discipline should apply equally to all fishing that's found to be actually illegal. But some members have proposed longer timeframes or geographical exceptions from the obligation to remove subsidies for fishing that's found to be, have been unreported or unregulated. And the argument generally that's put here is that members might need time to set up better systems um, to, to control or to at least record unreported or unregulated fishing to enable them to be more comprehensive in their application of this agreement. The alternative view perhaps is that members can begin to implement the subsidy obligation based on the systems they currently have. So this is one of the, the many sort of open questions as to how this particular decision uh, and this particular, this particular discipline, this particular kind of rule is going to be designed. Um, but coming back Pat, to a point that the ambassador made just to finish off, um, you know, the, the, the IUU part of the overall negotiations is one that's probably received almost the most attention and the most detailed, careful thought. And I think it's one of the areas where we see the most uh, general common understanding of what the approach should be and what the structure of the discipline should look like. So while these decisions are important, they're being made on the basis of, I think, a, a shared understanding of what the rule should overall look like. And that in itself is a major achievement for the negotiations. I'll leave it at that now and turn it perhaps back to Rashid, but I'm happy to come back to questions and details later. So thanks, thanks very much, Alice. Thank you for, for the details and the information that uh, you've just given to us all, yeah. Fantastic. So this is uh, three talks uh, summary. So 
Uh, hopefully, as we go into the Q&A session, you get more details and we'll build on the on the introductions given by our keynote speakers. So, so yeah, we, we get going. Uh, We've received a number of questions. We are going to do our best to go through them. Uh, if we can do all good, but if we can't, please, you, you know the speakers, you can always uh, contact them to get more information after this. And, and also, yeah, yeah. So to help us go through as many uh, of these as possible, please try to be, uh, to be, to, to give a short, quick answers, please, our speakers. So, so let's start off with uh, uh, Robert. There is a question for you here. Uh, what is the estimated portion of subsidized fishing taking place within uh, exclusive economic zones of countries, EEZ, and, and the international waters, the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction? Okay, that's a good question, but it's, it's actually quite a difficult one to answer. and. For the study that, that we did, um, we didn't uh, divide it necessarily between high seas and the EZs. We just used the FAO areas. So I'm afraid I, I can't completely answer that question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So this is this is this is why you have we have a chair here. So so I can at least add a little bit here, uh, Robert. So so we we actually published a paper. I believe this the years go so fast. I believe it's 2018, 2019, in Science Advances, where we look at the economics of high seas fishing. So it's very difficult, like Robert said, it's difficult to really trace and, and follow, but but uh, thanks to the work of the Global Fishing Watch and our group and National Geographic, we're able to bring data together. And one key piece of information is that most of the subsidies governments give uh, out go to large scale industrial fleet versus the small scale. I mean, over 80% actually of the, of, of the subsidies that we, we just told you about 35 billion goes to large scale industrial. And, and the remaining 20% or even less goes to small scale. So most of the fish, fishing boats on the high seas are large industrial. So we did that, those calculations and came up with an estimate. Uh, the bottom line is that high seas fishing boats get more in general than, than on average than, than, than uh, EZ fishing boats. All right, so let's then move on to we, we, uh, I'm going to take each one uh, under each of the speakers. So now we go to Ambassador Wales. Can we expect a deal this year? Uh, can we expect a deal this year? Thank you. Well, I, I truly hope so. And uh, I think at, at this time I remain optimistic and I'm convinced that, that it is still possible. But of course, we will need to work very hard on what we have left of this year in part because we still have some substantive issues to resolve and to get an agreement on within the whole membership. Um, and also given that, that the WTO ministerial conference had to be postponed, most probably to next year, this is a decision that will take place very soon. The membership will probably need to make a decision soon as well on how to deal with our deadline. So, so in short, I, I hope so. I think it's still possible. But of course, I also hope that the rest of the members remain as optimistic and positive as me. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, so, uh, and then, then we move on to Alice. There is something here to you. The question is, what is the meaning of withdrawing subsidies? What does it really mean? Uh, does it mean not continuing to provide them? Uh, how, 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 how is it featuring in the, in the discussions? Yeah, a real, a real technical point of WTO law. So, I mean, generally the, the understanding is that if your obligation is to withdraw subsidies, it means no longer providing them. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean clawing them back from the recipient after you've provided to them. So the general understanding it means from that point on, no more. No more, yeah, okay, wonderful. All right, thank you for that. Then we, uh, Robert, this is another one for you. Which fisheries or areas and uh, which fisheries that is in terms of area of fishing and the species being caught in the United States are top three recipients of subsidies? Another. Yeah, again, a, a rather tricky one. Um, and another one I'm afraid I can't, uh, can't answer directly. 
sorry about that. Um, because um, we we didn't really follow the, the fleet within the US um, to that to that level. But maybe Rashid, you you could provide again a bit more information. Yeah, I could just give a tip here. Uh, uh, when we published one of our estimates around 2009, I got a, I got a colleague from the California area, Renee Sharp. She, she contacted me and said, hey, uh, the US numbers have looked at them. I think we can do better because I know there are subsidies at the local government level and state level that are not captured in our estimate, which we always know, right? We see our estimates as... Uh, conservative because really. So we, I team up with her and we actually did a study, but this we published that in 2009 in the Journal of Fisheries Management. So the one who asked the question, please go in there. I know we, we nailed down up to species level and, and also areas of, of US, whether you are on the Pacific or the Atlantic and parts of that. So uh, I don't remember the, the numbers now vividly, but please uh, check out, uh, Sharp and Sumaila, 2009, the Journal of Fisheries Management. Thank you. All right, so we get back to Ambassador. This is a question for you. What is the consequences of failure? If for any reason the WTO doesn't help us nail this down, what do you think are the consequences? And I'm sure there are many dimensions to this question. You can take whichever, please. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's, it's a very tricky question. As, as you said, uh, Chair, it, it's, uh, it has a lot of perspectives where, where you can find say, comfort in, in answers on in this question, but I'll probably focus in, in one, and that is, or, or maybe two. I, I wouldn't go in depth in the let's say, economic consequences or the, or the direct consequences of sustainability uh, of, of, uh, of not reaching an agreement. Uh, I think that, that, as I mentioned at, at the end of my presentation, the um, I think there's two components of the importance of this agreement. I'll probably sh shift the question to the positive. And that is, why should we reach an agreement in, in, in the fishery subsidies negotiations? And one is that for, for the organization, for the World Trade Organization, is, is a key negotiation. It's, it's one of the only multilateral negotiations at this time. Uh, and uh, part of the image of the credibility of the organization is being held uh, let's call it hostage of, of the success of this negotiation. So that's, that per se is very, very important. Uh, on the sustainability part, the, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the subsidies for IUU fishing and let's say the harmful subsidies in general for, for fisheries is that one last piece of the puzzle that needs to fit in the international agreements, different codes of conduct we have uh, under international law and even domestic law as well. So, so not being able to complete the puzzle would, would be very harmful for how we deal with sustainability, with the adequate and sustainable con cons conservation of the oceans and our marine resources. So I think that, that uh, this is one of those agreements where we need to have an agreement, we need to reach a deal, it has to be meaningful, uh, we just need to find the best way to do that and hopefully in the most efficient manner. All right, yeah. So thank you again, uh, uh, Robert. We have another question coming to you. you. In your presentation, you indicated that one country, that is China, provides 20 times the harmful subsidies than the next country on the list. So will the effort to reach consensus at the WTO result in definitions that allow China to continue this subsidy or locking capacity that has been developed through there are harmful subsidies over a number of years. If not, why will China agree to this limitation? Uh -huh. Well, I think I can answer part of that question, but, that, but um, part of it may also be uh, more relevant to Ambassador Wills or, or Alice. I think Alice. Um, that, that indeed China um, it has the largest fleet, the, the, most, the largest number of fishers, and a, a large distant water fleet as well. So, so the, it, it does pro provide a lot of subsidies in terms of uh, fuel alone is a, is a very large subsidy. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of what would they agree to and, and how would they agree, and, uh, that is, uh, I suppose is, well, is coming through the, the negotiations and maybe other panelists would like to say something. Yeah, fantastic. Alice, do you want to take on this before the ambassador comes on, please? 
I can probably take on sort of part of it, and it's perhaps sort of to echo the last point that Robert was making. Um, you know, I, I mean, my, my sense, and this is just an informal sense, um, is that the, the large players amongst WTO members all appreciate the importance of these negotiations for kind of the, the as a dem for its demonstration effect for the functionality of the WTO system and of multilateral rulemaking, um, and as a contribution broadly to sort of international caretaking of the oceans and its marine resources. So I think uh, kind of they're all aware of the fact that this negotiation to be credible um, needs to involve some meaningful change in subsidy patterns. Now, who, how, you know, how much is each member willing to give? That is exactly the question for the negotiations. Um, and I think it's, it's a question that's come up a lot in this discussion of special and differential treatment, which is what we were talking about just before. Um, and my sense is that there's a realization amongst WTO members that while special and differential treatment is still, as, as the mandate says, going to be an integral part of these negotiations, we're going to have to be a bit more creative about how we design different obligations for different members at different stages of development. Um, exactly what that looks like. There are a number of proposals on the table uh, that suggest different things. But I think there is a realization that we're going to have to go about it in a different and creative way rather than simply dividing kind of all members by the same traditional divisions that we did and applying obligations purely on the basis of that traditional division. But I'd be interested to hear what the ambassador Excellent, yeah. Ambassador, you want to add anything or do you want us to? Yeah, I'll probably just add, add the, to the, the political part of, of or the perspective of for this answer. And that is that, that for reaching an agreement, as is the case for any other agreement in the WTO, even when you have to negotiate a private contract, you need to compromise. And, uh, and I think at, at this point, what I've heard from members, um, everybody's ready to compromise. Everybody's trying to show flexibility. And I mentioned to them at the end of last year that this is the point where we need to make ourselves uncomfortable. Uh, push forward. This is, as Alice was saying, this is an agreement that has the support of the whole membership of the WTO. And in order to reach an agreement that is compatible with the interest of everyone, but also that complies with our mandate of the SDG and that, that seeks this of sustainability purpose, uh, we all need to compromise. So, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, so, so if I may add a little bit and, uh, the, to the question of why will China agree to this? Uh, I've always believed that one of the ways we can get countries to really take this serious is for, to make them realize. And when I say make them, I'm talking about scientists, economists within these countries to make their governments realize that these subsidies are, we are giving is hurting their people. It's not helping the poor as they claim, it's actually undermining them. And a little glimmer of hope, you know, uh, those of you who follow Sophia, the, the FAO report on agriculture and fisheries, in the last one, I think 2018, in there, there's a statement where China has actually promised itself, not to the world, not to the WTO, to cut its subsidies, fuel subsidies by up to, if I remember correctly, 40%. This is China itself because they are realizing that this is killing the, the, the fish they, they love to eat and that supports jobs. So all these countries, and this is what I tell African countries, I go to Latin America, I go to Southeast Asia, I said, this thing, you guys just look at it closely. You yourself, rather you choose to use your, your, your public funds to do the other things than to undermine the resources that people depend on. Uh, you, you, you love your coastal communities, this is not what you do. So I think that realization is already making China uh, to make such a profit pro, uh, promise in, in public, actually. I, I remember underlining that sentence when I read it. So, China may find that it's good for them to do it. Hopefully, let's keep pushing. That's why I'm in the information business, the science mm. business, trying to make people realize what this really means. All right. So let's go, go on to the next one. And this is to Ambassador. Uh, in our questions, you see there's quite a bit on uh, coming to the political side, Ambassador. So thanks for all your answers. This one is, in 2015, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea rendered its advisory opinion on IUU fishing activities. What is its impact 
on WTO negotiations, some subsidies to IEU fishing, if any. Is a question? Yeah, well, I, I can't really go into the, into the details and how it affected proposals by members, but I think that, that uh, this, this type of facts of evidence that we have around the world is, it is, is the basis in which members construct as well their proposals, serves as the mm -hmm. basis for the whole membership to discuss these proposals, to discuss new ideas, uh, and it, it, it provides let's say, a more general understanding of, of uh, let's say, the basis of our negotiations, of, of, of those other pieces of the puzzle that we already have uh, put, put together that, that, as I mentioned, still misses our point, that is the, the elimination and controlling of the of harmful, harmful subsidies. So, so I would say that I think it, it, it contributes in, in the way that, that members have more information on their table, are able to construct better their proposals. We have a better basis to discuss proposals and to reach an agreement that fits within this big puzzle. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, so Alice, this one for you. Can Alice comment on SDG 14.6 that calls for the elimination of subsidies to overfishing and IEU fishing? Can you comment on, on that? Sure. I mean, very, very briefly, that's in the language in, in SDG 14.6, if I remember correctly, uh, essentially uses much of the language of the original WTO mandate for these negotiations, right? So, so WTO member uh, governments back in 2001 and then in 2005 uh, instructed ministers essentially instructed negotiators to refine the rules on subsidies with a focus on fisheries subsidies. Uh, including a prohibition, if I remember the word incorrectly, a prohibition on certain subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. Mm. So the overcapacity and overfishing elements have been part of the WTO mandate from the beginning. What was interesting about SDG 14.6 is that it took that overfishing and overcapacity language and added the elimination of subsidies to IUU fishing. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of that additional political signal, and at the end of the day, the SDGs were approved by at the very highest level of government by everyone's heads of state. Um, that sort of indication signaled to negotiators that for subsidies to overcapacity over fishing um, and subsidies to IUU fishing had, uh, at least in the SDG context, a particular focus. Now, one of the things, the additional idea I think that's on the table in the negotiations, which is a really interesting and a good one, is to focus on prohibiting subsidies where stocks are already overfished. Mm. So thinking of the Kobe plot that, that Robert put up, at a certain point, uh, your fish, the biomass of your fish stock is so low compared to what it would be at MSY or what it would be without fishing, that your stock is overfished and you really desperately at that point need to start managing your fishing effort to bring it back to a healthy state. So the additional idea, in addition to IUU fishing and overcapacity and overfishing uh, in the negotiations, is a focus on disciplining subsidies where fish stocks are in that very overfished condition. I hope yeah. that helps. No, no, that's great. So, so our other two speakers, you you want to add anything here uh, on top of what Alice has said on this question, or? No, you, 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 you're happy, okay. So there is, uh, let's see, let me get my screen up. Uh, yes, so, so, so still with, with Alice, this one says, what method will be used to determine whether due process requirements are up to the agreed standards? And what are those standards and which authority will make that determination? Okay, perhaps one point of clarification to start with. The determination is the original decision that IEU fishing has taken place, right? And what this agreement does is that essentially it would mean that WTO members all agree collectively that if there is a determination of IEU fishing made by an, you know, an RFMO enlisting a vessel or by a coastal state or a flag state or a port state, if there is that determination and it meets certain due process requirements, they agree to withdraw their subsidies from that vessel or operator. Mm. So part of the question was, you know, how do we, who decides whether those due process requirements have been met? I mean, in the first instance, it's the subsidizing member, right? So the subsidizing member looks at its obligations. It sees that if it 
sees that there's been a determination made uh, with respect to a vessel or an operator that it subsidizes, the subsidizing member looks at sort of the, the way that the determination was made and then decides, you know, yes, this is this, you know, these due process requirements are met. Um, and I, uh, I, as a subsidizing member, decide to withdraw <coughs> some of these because I comply with my obligations. Now, if the subsidizing member says, I don't think the due process requirements have been met, I'm keeping my subsidies, then uh, under the WTO's current system, another WTO member could challenge that decision. And this is the beauty of the WTO having a, uh, a dispute settlement system, right? So a WTO member, another WTO member could say to the subsidizing member, listen, the determination is clear, the due process requirements have been met, you should be withdrawing your subsidies. And then that decision goes to, through the WTO's dispute settlement system. Um, and at this point, a WTO panel would look at all of the evidence and make its own decision about whether that member had complied with its obligations or not. So I guess okay. it's interesting. Wonderful, that, that's, 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 that's great. So uh, what do you think of geographical? Uh, so let me see. I go back. Yeah, we still. I I, I have I have a, a general question. You know, the, the WTO is a multilateral kind of uh, agreement, right? You have. Uh, so I'm I'm looking around and thinking. Do you know of any multilateral, not as big as the WTO, a group of countries in the world that have agreed to to remove? Harmful subsidies. Is there any example that you know of that you can inform the audience? Uh, I'm seeing this as a question that might lead us to some discussions of practical ways forward. Anything that comes to mind? And this is to the three of you, uh, not only Alice here. Yeah. I can pitch in a couple of ideas. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and 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 there's and there's a couple of examples I think um, one is in the and it's two it's actually two two trade agreements um, focused in the in the Pacific and in the North Air, North American area, so the USMCA as it's called um, so what was NAFTA, NAFTA renegotiated um, and the CPTPP. Uh, yeah. The tough one. <laughs> if I've gotten the acronym correct. So that was again kind of the, the, the Trans Pacific Partnership um, Agreement amongst a, a group of countries around the Pacific Ocean, um, which was then renegotiated. Um, uh, and to, to my knowledge, I think the obligations in both of those agreements are similar. Um, and to my knowledge, both of them look at subsidies to IUU fishing and subsidies to overfished stocks. So there's some examples out there of, of the way these sorts of rules have been designed in the past. Yeah, right on. You've scored 100%, Alice. These are these are two <laughs> these are two uh, two agreements that have uh, caught my attention. You know, and and I'm, I'm I'm hoping that this could be helpful in a way. Here we have a group of diverse countries that have agreed. They have actually agreed. They, they, TPP and, and the latest one, like you try to, it's a, it's a difficult acronym there. And they have agreed on this and I actually looked at that. The countries in there are big fishing nations, actually. If you take out their subsidies alone, that's a big chunk. I don't, I don't, I, I did these calculations before. It's about a third of all the global subsidies, if I remember correctly. And then you have the Canada, Mexico, US uh, agreement. In them too, they do have agreement. And these two blocks actually are very important. The question is, how do they agree? And, and why do they agree? And since they have agreed, can we just transfer the agreement into the WTO negotiations? Is this the kind of thing that is uh, uh, on my mind? So to me, None of those countries can now argue against an agreement because actually they have already agreed, right? So, so that's the kind of thing I'm, 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 I'm thinking about. And the TPP one in particular, they do have Vietnam in there and it's a developing country. And actually they put in an arrangement to, to, to get Vietnam to sign. So it's almost similar as the WTO negotiations uh, giving out some considerations to developing countries. For example, they, they talk about supporting science in Vietnam to make them be able to assess their fisheries and all that. 
So, Ambassador, what do you think about this? Could this has this come in the in the discussions, or or could this be a way to help us uh, move forward? Well, I, I think that that uh, my answer is, is quite similar to the one I gave on the on on, on Idlos, uh, some time yeah. before, uh, in saying that that those those are let's say facts and evidence of what we have currently in 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 different international agreements that relate to the fisheries, let's say sector in general, and in this particular case, to fisheries subsidies. So I think uh, I mean I, I couldn't go into into details mm -hmm. on, on how these particular provisions are being dealt with in our negotiations. Um, but but I, I think it's it's uh, it's interesting to see how how members take all these facts to build their and construct their, their proposals, how to, to discuss the, the the negotiations at hand, the different things we have on the table to discuss on the different sessions that 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 uh, we've been having. So 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 yeah, I think it's important to to take into account all these other agreements, all these other provisions we have around, and and it it definitely serves a purpose for the for the negotiations. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. So, so it's something you, know, yeah, yeah, that has come up. It's at least on the table, which is uh, encouraging. Thank you. Now, this is a question that uh, any one of you can address. So, in the absence of the agreement, does any WTO member take a retaliatory measure against the fishing country that uses harmful subsidies, or against the import of fishery product from the fishing country that? uses harmful subsidies under the existing applicable WTO rules? Ha. Long question. Is that clear enough? So you, if you don't have an agreement, is, it, is there a possibility for countries essentially to take things in their own hands and say, hey, for you to 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 sell fish to to uh, uh, to bring to 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 export fish to our our country, yeah, you have to clean yourself of the subsidies. Otherwise, there's no opportunity for you to do that. Uh, that's my interpretation of the question. Yeah. Can I offer a kind of a partial response? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think. It, so the existing, so if we don't have this particular agreement on fisheries subsidies, the, the basic trade rules that apply to the measures that countries take with respect to the import and export of fish are then the, the basic existing WTO rules, right? Um, now those rules allow members to, to take kind of sometimes unilateral action um, against imports of fish uh, or against subsidies that are provided in another country to the fishing industry, but not on the basis of those subsidies environmental effects, mm. only on the basis of those subsidies trade effects. Okay. So, 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 so currently under the WTO rules, you can take unilateral measures against imports of, or subsidies um, that are provided to the fishing industry, but only to address those subsidies impact on trade of fish, not to address the subsidies wider impact on the environment more generally. Hmm. All right, excellent. So, so next question, uh, this is to Ambassador. Do negotiation discussions include international trade policy and mechanisms like tariffs for potentially limiting market access for wrongly subsidized catches. This is related to the last question, actually, in a way. Well, the, the, in, in the negotiations in the WTO, we're, we're trying to, to, to keep on with, with, with the mandate as established in previous ministerial decisions in the WTO and that we now have also in SDG target 14.6. So we are basically focusing on subsidies. So subsidies mm -hmm. in IOU fishing, subsidies that, that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing, and as mentioned by Alice as well, subsidies uh, that go to fishing on stocks that are already overfished. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, again, I can't go into the details of what's being proposed, but, but, uh, but I would just leave it that, that we're dealing with, with the subsidies that go to the, to the fisheries in general. All right, excellent. So, uh, this question uh, is directed to Alice, but I think uh, Robert, you could give it a try first, and then uh, Alice can can add. 
And why do I say that? Is because you looked at uh, subsidies IEU in West Africa. So you may have something to say here. And the question is, what do you think of geographical carve-outs for special and differential treatment? Is that a good way to preserve subsidies for small scale fishers in developing countries? Robert, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I, I think, it, I'll, I'll, I'll let Alice give a more detail. Um, but I, I mean, I think that um, the, for me, the, the issues are really around the sort of data and understanding what of what the status of the of the stocks are, and ensuring that, that if if there are subsidies being given to whatever fleet, that they are not contributing to, to overcapacity and uh, overfishing, and particularly in, in places that may be more more vulnerable. And I think um, that's that's one of the, the difficult issues to address. But I'll, I'll let uh, Alice say a bit more about this. Alice, and, and also the ambassador can add something if you want uh, after Alice. Mm. Sure, well, just to pick up kind of the point that Rob was Robert was making. Uh, you know, I think one of the one of the arguments that's often put um, <clears throat> and one of the concerns that's often raised in response to the idea of geographical exceptions for subsidies for to protect small scale fisheries. Is, is that essentially what you're doing there is that you're allowing subsidies that could contribute to overcapacity and to overfishing to continue in a particular geographical area. Now, assuming that you could control that properly, which is a big question, I'm not sure you could. But even if you could, essentially what that means is that you're allowing harmful subsidies to keep being provided to small scale fishing closest to shore, if you pick the, the territorial sea, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the question that raises in my mind is, well, is that really good policy, right? Do you really want to be giving yourself as, as a government or yourself as, as governments, the space to keep providing harmful subsidies to fisheries exploited by people who may have very few other options, socially and economically, other than fishing? So, you know, I think it's, I, I think it, it's a, it's a kind of a, it intellectually, it's a sort of a, it's, a, it's attractive for its simplicity. Um, and it's attractive because it sort of starts to mirror, we think the way that jurisdictions are divided in the law of the sea. But when you actually think about what the impact of the rule is, I'm not sure it's good policy. I think it risks allowing the problem we're trying to solve to be perpetuated in areas where fishers are particularly vulnerable to the problem we're trying to solve overcapacity and overfishing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's fantastic. It's, it's, uh, to me, it's allowing the short term needs to, to overrun the medium and long term. And, and this, and I do understand why we people, we, we see the long term as the, uh, the short term as something that we just have to deal with because it's near, it's close, and it's challenging. But I also say, and this is something I say when I'm in the developing world, I say, you know, if you cannot, no matter your circumstances, and this is a, a, bit, a bit tough to say, no matter your circumstances, if you are not able to look a little bit ahead, medium, long term, you won't be able to solve your, your, your short term problems properly because all you do is to postpone it to the next day and to the next day and to the next day. So I think, is society as in general, and I'm talking about national governments, national societies, and the global, regional, to really find a way to help these communities that are already overfished their stocks, who don't have any options to find ways and means of helping them to pull back a bit so the fish can do better and therefore improve their livelihoods in the, in the medium and, and long term. And I know it's challenging, but we cannot just pretend that the solution is to let people keep digging themselves into the hole, really. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we still have a question here. Or, or what connection do you see between the WTO negotiations and the negotiations for, new, for a new treaty on areas beyond national jurisdiction, the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in the high seas, essentially. Yeah, what connections do you see, if any? Any one of you can take it? 
No taker. You know, this connects to the earlier question we had about how much of a how much subsidies is encouraging overfishing in the high seas versus EEZ. So, so in a way, I think those negotiations, in my view, cannot just ignore the issue of of uh, subsidies to to vessels that will end up if we don't close the high seas, as some of us have have proposed, just close the damn high seas from fishing. It's not good for you economically, socially, and, and biologically, but okay, I'm not a politician. I cannot get this done. If we're going to allow fishing, then, then really taking harmful subsidies is a crucial part of it. Why do I say that? We, we, I think this paper I've cited the second time now, in, in the Salah et al paper, where we look at uh, economies of fishing in the high seas, we found out that 54% of the fishing grounds in the high seas will not be profitable if not for subsidies and if not for slave labor like wages. So there you go. So if we can tame subsidies and make sure people pay human beings decent salaries, uh, then 54% of, of the economists will take care of 54% of the fishing taking place. On, on high seas fishing ground. So there you go, there is a big connection there. And um, yeah, for the negotiators, I hope some of them are online and this is uh, a message that came out of that paper very clearly. All right, so uh, we are moving into the, the last 10 minutes we have. So let's keep going. Are there plans to establish a transparent global list of vessels and companies engaging in illegal fishing? Any one of you can take this. No? <laughs> I don't know of any such plan. I mean, so so the panelists, we, we don't know together. We don't know. We know NGOs and uh, a number of uh, this trade organization, NGO, uh, has been collecting. There, there are a number of lists, but they are not consolidated. And that is a problem almost similar to the point that Ambassador raised in terms of uh, subsidies data not being available. People are just not telling us. So that's why academics have to do the best they can to provide the world some, some information here. All right. So well, well, there's a, another one that any one of you can take. Noting that determinations of IEU prosecutions can take years what can be done to prevent harmful subsidies being provided to high risk vessels during that interim period whilst a case may be ongoing, all right? So you catch somebody fishing illegally, you take them to court and it takes time to actually prosecute. So what do we do in the interim? Any ideas? Tough question, huh? Yeah. This is a difficult question. And uh, uh, if I may talk a, a little bit, uh, South Africa, years ago, South Africa tried to, to, to work on illegal fishing. And what they realized was that the, the judicial system is not used to seeing, uh, used to seeing uh, illegal fishing as a, as a crime. And so you will catch somebody breaking the law on the sea, take them to court, and the judge will say, what has the person done? This guy just went fishing, go home. So what they did was actually to create an interim environmental crime court to sensitize the judicial system. So this, this was an interim measure, and it, I think it had a life of three years just to get the judges to know that this is serious stuff, and I, I think it has improved the situation. What else? What do you think of, uh, I think we've done this, how can the civil society community best support WTO members in reaching an agreement? Ha. Ambassador, what can we do to help you? <laughs> well, that, that's a, uh, it's also a hard question, uh, but I think that as, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, it's important that, that we have overall support for the negotiations. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and having, uh, say, a, a part of civil society requesting for the negotiations to slow down or, or to be halted 
uh, in general with no no deadline on, and, and, and in their vision um it's it's not helpful uh but but i think this type of events are very helpful so and that's why i wanted to to, to thank again chatham house and, and the contribution of pew as well in in this webinar because um being able to talk about the the importance of the wto negotiations uh, getting that information outside of course not the details and not the, the, the confidential parts of the negotiations but but what we're trying to do and i think the the the, the importance and uh, the purpose that, that we have in the WTO with these negotiations and our mandate by SDG 14.6 is key. So being able to speak out uh, and, and show what we're doing is, is very important so that we can, we can actually explain what we're doing and try to get that support from civil society back, back to us and to the members. Wonderful. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, I, I think uh, given I'm looking at the time, I really don't want to keep you here one minute over because you've been wonderful. It's been a long uh, Zoom and uh, you've participated all this time. So I think I will just use this question actually to kind of challenge our audience. And, and, and so this is a perfect question for me. I've been thinking about this. So for, for the audience, the participants, please, this is my challenge to you look through your connections. If you are a national um, uh, civil society participant, check your country, find out the three people, the three people in your domain, whether it's your country, your region, the world, who, who can help in one way or the other help the WTO negotiations. If each one of you can think of this and, and do whatever you can do, send letters, have dinners with them, virtually you can actually have a dinner virtually with people these days and 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 try to impress of them how important these issues are how we need them to use whatever leverage they have in order to help the world tackle one of its key problems and and and, and ensuring that we have a, an ocean full of life that is teeming with life and that supports us and not only us alive here but future generations that is that 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 distributes the benefits of the ocean fairly uh, to all sorts of groups women men to vulnerable people coastal people who wouldn't have protein to eat without fish this is what this is all about so if you can pick out one to three people in your domain and push them to help the WTO get an agreement this year you would have done an amazing job so that is essentially my wrap up. What I will do now is to call upon Anna and, and call on all of you to give our, our members a nice clap, our speakers for a fantastic job. And uh, thank you so much. All the best to all the effort you are putting in Ambassador and your team and all the negotiators. The world needs you. And I think that WTO also needs an agreement because this is a delicate time in multilateral organizations. So let's get something done. Let's make the world's population happy, and that will be wonderful for everybody. Anna, thank you, and please come and uh, help us wrap this up. Thank you very much, Rashid, and uh, thanks to the excellent speakers. That was a, it was an absolutely um, super interesting session. Uh, the forum continues tomorrow. Uh, we will be hosting a session on IU fishing in Southeast Asia, uh, and we will begin a bit earlier than today. The session will start at noon UK time. So please register for that in case you haven't already done it. This forum is very popular. So we are kind of going up against Zoom and maximum capacity at the moment. So if you're unable to register, I'd also just like to flag that we are live streaming this on the Chatham House website. So. You'll still be able to watch uh, and you can use something called Slido to ask questions. So um, it is possible to participate even if we do go against Zoom capacity. So thanks again and thanks to you also Rashid, you were absolutely amazing as chair. Have a very nice uh, well day or evening everybody. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you so bye. much. Uh, a clap for everybody. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much.